Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful and thankful for the opportunity that you've given us here together to feast upon your word, to examine that which is true, to search these things out so that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. We give you all of the glory and honor and praise. Please, Lord, filter out that which is not of you, but seal to our hearts only that which is true. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com, and we're studying together verse by verse in the epistle of Titus. We're in chapter 3, verse 4. Verses uh, 4 and 5. Now, sometimes we reach false conclusions, and then we build on those conclusions. kind of reminds me of, of a product I bought one time that I had to assemble. And on the, the different parts, you know, it had letters uh, you know, when you went by the instructions, you had to look at where all the C's and all the D's and all the E's, you know, connected. And it's easy to get off kind of on the wrong foot. And when we do that, folks, when we fail to build uh, precept upon precept, and when we discard a certain truth, we just lay that aside because we don't particularly like what it's saying, or we get the wrong interpretation of it, and we build on that, it will take us to a place where we don't really want to go. So it's, it's important, I believe, to, the, to those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, that we build carefully on biblical doctrine, sound doctrine, sound, healthy teaching. And so much of what is called Christianity today is emotional, for the most part, rather than intellectual. And I'm, I'm not saying that, that there's not some emotion connected with your understanding of all that God's done for you, uh, some emotion connected to your relationship with the Lord. I hope that there is. There should be. But what is tremendously important is the intellectual understanding of what he's done, not any emotional approach to that. And we only know that by doctrine. And it's astounding to me how many Christians fear biblical doctrine? You know, it's divisive. And some of the texts that we're about to deal with are texts which have caused great divisions among Christians. There should be a complete understanding of what God has done for us in Christ. You know, you would think that every Christian would want to know just as a child does on, on Christmas, or even before Christmas, what lies under the tree. You know, all the gifts that, that we've received. You'd think that every Christian would want to know that and devote much time to the understanding of that. Everything that we've received from God is a gift. He died in our place, in our place. He didn't give himself in order to provide some chance of our being redeemed, some opportunity if we would, was willing to accept it. He gave himself in our place. He acted first. He did something that, is, that was unchangeable. That he did something for us first before we ever 
were even capable of making any decision for him that had a result. What he did had a result. And that result worked itself out in our lives where that we came to understand the truth concerning who we are in Christ. He gave himself in our place, and he did that in order to redeem us from all iniquity, not some iniquity, but all iniquity, and purify us. And he did that. We are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Not because we live that way, not because we live in such a way that we could, you know, say that, you know, we are holy, but that we have been made righteous because Jesus Christ died in our place. And he fulfilled the law. If you are under law, you placed yourself there, folks. You, you fell from grace. God declares that you are not under law. You're under grace. And sin shall not have dominion over you. That's what the Word says. Most Christians seem to read that as though sin should not have dominion over you and you're going to fight it and you're going to try the best you can the truth of god's word is it will not sin shall not have dominion over you god causes you to triumph and you've been given the victory jesus christ died in your place he didn't die for you in some provisional sense he took your place and there's a result of that you have been bought back from all iniquity and purified as a result of that doctrine, which causes us to arrange ourselves in an orderly fashion and submit ourselves to those whom He has placed over us to be subject to, good or bad. And that is a hard, hard truth to accept. Until, and this is just my personal opinion, until we come to understand that our being subject to the powers that be because God ordained those powers, whether they are good or bad, and they've always been that, they've always either been good or bad, we are subjecting ourselves to God, not man. Just like Leah subjected herself to Jacob, despite how Jacob treated her. But more importantly, how Jesus himself subjected himself to the authorities. I pointed out in my last video the reality of Jesus and, and Pilate and folks, I'll just simply put it this way. If you want to look for a loophole, if you want to look for an out, if you want to look for an excuse, if you want to look for some exception there to the rule, go right ahead. But do not expect to find yourself standing in the same orderly place that your, your own Savior did when He stood before them and became subject to the ordinances that God had placed over him. So let's go on with our study here in Titus. What I want you to note that, that here is that we had three, three verses in chapter 3, and once again we're back to what God's done for us. And this is absolutely characteristic of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians, we've got three full chapters on what God's done for us before he ever mentions any accountability, any responsibility on the part of the Christian. And here in Titus, we've been directed to doctrine, to what it does, back to doctrine, to what we should do, then back to doctrine again. I'm going to try to put this on the screen, so I hope that you can see this. 
Verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. And I believe that to be the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He might become our kinsman redeemer. That's where the kindness and love of God appeared. And He's our Savior. Verse 5 has caused great difficulty among Christians. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, as I prefer to say. Sounds like a simple verse. You know, in fact, it's, it's one that everybody learns in, in Soul Winning 101. But let's be careful here, folks. Absolutely not by works in the righteousness which we have done. Now, that ought to alert us that we need to be careful here with the word righteous. What is righteousness? Well, everybody knows that's, that's not, righteousness is not, um, that's not breaking the speed limit. That's not committing adultery or fornication. It's not robbing banks. It's not bearing false witness. It's not shooting your neighbor. You know, well, are you sure about that? He that doeth righteousness is righteous. That is how righteousness is defined. And folks, we need to be careful of our definitions. If righteousness is an action, then we have a verse of Scripture that says, He that doeth righteousness is righteousness. If we say that righteousness is not breaking the speed limit, then everybody who doesn't break the speed limit, I, well, I guess they're righteous, right? No. Such a conclusion as that is biblically false, for even, even the plowing of the wicked, even the worship of the wicked is sin. Christ said that the hireling flees because he's a hireling, and that, again, is one of those simple but profound statements. You know, we seem to think that a man becomes a murderer because he committed murder. Absolutely not. If the man were not a murderer, he never would have killed. If he were not a robber, he'd, he'd, he would have never stole. You know, a person doesn't become a robber by stealing. One steals because he's a robber. One kills because he's a killer. One flees because he's a hireling. He doesn't become a, hire, a hireling by fleeing. But we seem to want to, what we want to do is we want to reverse all that, okay? And, and just as one who, who d does not kill unless one is a killer, so one does not do righteousness unless one is righteous. Are you following me? Therefore, Many acts of what people may call righteous have nothing to do with the deliverance that is ours in Christ. For you to actually do righteousness, you must be righteous. Why do we always put the action first? If one is to do righteousness, one must be righteous. That ought to be absolutely apparent. So it doesn't have anything to do with righteousness until you're righteous. You have to be made righteous before the Lord Jesus delivered you and me from the sphere 
of unrighteousness, and he placed us in the sphere of righteousness by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Both of these are genitives. The New Testament is full of genitives. You know, it's like one stood back and took a shotgun and shot it full of genitives. So what do we do with the genitives here? Now, those of you out there who, who are more familiar with the Greek, you know that when it comes to genitives, they can be, they can be a subjective genitive or an objective genitive genitive and it's the direction of the genitive that's so important you know some translations will say faith of god genitive that's a genitive some will say faith in god you know that is our faith even though it's a genitive that says faith of god you know there's a lot of translations today a whole lot of them and I'm not going to push any particular translation. I think they're all good if you use them right. But there are many modern translations that, that would put it faith in God, even though it's, it, it, it says faith of God. Now, I think the reason for that, you know, this is just my own personal take on it, is because if they, if they said faith of God, well, they couldn't sell it to the predominant Arminian theology that it exists today in, in most of modern Christianity. You know, you could have sold it easily 400 years ago because 400 years ago people believed the truth, but most of Christianity today has made assumptions which are not biblical, and almost every modern translation will ignore that genitive. And I'm going to suggest that the noun washing is a noun which describes an action in the Greek grammar. When you study this, you know it's a noun which, which describes activity. We have washing as a noun of action in the genitive case, the washing of regeneration. But if the noun describes an action, the direction of the genitive is assured. So we read this by, by regeneration's washing, possessive washing, that, in other words, that regeneration washes. Now, bear in mind that we have just set ourselves apart for most of modern Christianity today, in which there is an entire system that teaches that you got to be baptized to go to heaven. Baptismal regeneration that if you're not water baptized, you're not saved, which is very similar to the teachings of Romanism. And baptismal regeneration comes primarily from this verse. When the rule of Greek grammar requires that it is regeneration that washes, not washing that regenerates. Are you following me? Peter said to Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. And, and what did Jesus say? Jesus answered and said, if I do not wash you, you have no part, that is, no, no fellowship with me. Where Peter then said, well, oh, wow, if that's the case, well, then give me a bath. I'm paraphrasing there, of course. And then Christ answered and said, he who has bathed needs, needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. And he was referring to Judas. Now, if you look at that in the Greek, one is to wash part of the body, and the other is to completely cleanse the body. And that, that, ought, that chapter ought to devastate those who teach baptismal regeneration. Oh, but what about the word regeneration? And that's what I want to spend a little time on. Why isn't it just generation? Well, I mean, what is this regeneration bit? You know? Well, that's composed of two Greek words. Palin, meaning again, 
and Genesis meaning birth. Literally, the word means, regeneration means to give life a second time from the same source. That's what it means. And the renewing, also from two words, ana and kainos, which means making new a second time, exactly like you did the first time. Wow, okay? So let's look at what theologians teach, and I guess you can take your choice. I, I've made a chart here. I'll put this up on the screen. The popular theological teaching is that God did it the first time in Adam. He gave Adam life, but, but, but I lost it when Adam sinned, and then there's the born-again life. The first, the first one was in Adam. The second one was new birth. The second teaching is that these two births or, or generations are one human and the other spiritual. So just like you have a, a human birth, you have a spiritual birth. And the third and the right one, I believe, is that these are both spiritual. I know I've touched on this in past videos, but it stands uh, to repeating since it appears in our present study here. We know from Scripture that we sinned in Adam and we died as a result of Adam's sin. We also know that there was a universal aspect of Christ's death in that all that, that died in Adam were made alive in Christ. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And we read Paul saying in Romans 7, I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. How could Paul say that he was alive once apart from the law? Because Adam's transgression was removed from Paul's life when Christ died. He was made alive. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and Paul died. The commandment that came to Adam, if you remember, was thou shalt not eat. The commandment that came to Paul was thou shalt not covet, and I'm going to suggest that I believe that it's impossible biblically to support the position that the first birth was in Adam and the second one was in Christ. Human or spiritual, that, as far as I can see, only leaves the third possibility. That there are two generations, there are two givings of spiritual life, there are two births, not one human and one spiritual, but both being spiritual. I was alive in Adam, I died in Adam. I was made alive in Christ. The commandment came, sin revived, and I died in my own sin. That is my own sin. I can't, I can't blame Adam for my being a sinner. Then I was born again by God from above. Let me back up a moment. If I'm, if I'm the, not the non-elect, and if I'm not born again, even though my, my, my transgressions were removed, Christ, His death removed my Adam's transgressions, but I was never born again. And the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now I died in my own sins. I'm twice dead, just like Jude says. And I stand before God at the great white throne judgment. There's no way I can blame Adam for my being a sinner. Because Christ removed my transgressions. He did that for all men, folks. The atonement was universal in the sense that this is, this is why Jesus said, or John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of what? The elect? No. Of the world. And this is all, also explains why children go to heaven. No child will go to hell. If you connect the dots, this is, what you, this is where you're left. Okay? No child in hell. No, no non-elect person standing before God blaming Adam for, for well, why, why are you sending me to hell for something Adam did? I hope you're getting this, folks regeneration generated twice okay the first time we were generated was being made alive in Christ through his death 
but then we died in our own sins. As Paul says in Romans 7, I was, I was alive once apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So now I need born again. There's the other generation. Now we've got two generations, regeneration, and I believe that defines the word that we're looking at in the text. And I hope I've explained this correctly. Because if I didn't, I probably ought to quit doing this. It's not complicated, folks. Two generations equaling a, or making up, defining a regeneration. So it was, it's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It was regeneration's washing. That is, no works on our part were allowed by God. You know, ask yourself, and I want you to ask, folks to ask yourself, where, where did Paul say that you must be born again. And don't you find that a little odd that he never used that phrase? Famous phrase. The truth is, he didn't. And he was probably the greatest evangelist that ever lived. Wrote Well, he wrote at least 13 epistles. Never wrote the words, you must be born again. Or to be more specific, to say it more correctly, the Holy Spirit never through Paul wrote, you must be born again. And you would think that he would have said that someplace, but he didn't. If you were to look at the language, we use a different word. Ye must be born again when, when is what the English says, must when Nicodemus was hearing, and I'm going to put this up on the screen, look at it, Delta, Epsilon, Iota, a three-letter Greek word, pronounced die, by the way. And Nicodemus knew that he had nothing to do with it. He knew it from the language. He didn't say, how can I do this? He said, how is it possible for this to happen to a man it is necessary, Jesus said, it is necessary. I mean, his language was expressing the must of necessity. He wasn't telling, and I've covered this in, in past videos as well, he wasn't telling Nicodemus that he had to do something. He was simply speaking of the new birth as being a necessity. Now, you may, you may not want to believe that, folks, but the language is clear as crystal. I don't know why it is that when I tell Christians that they did nothing to be born again, you know, they look at me like, like I've said, a, you know, a cow lays an egg or something like that. John 1 13, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. For 400 years, generations have been born into a religious system that has departed from the truth of this book, folks. It's departed from the truth of God's Word. This is not something that's happened in your lifetime. This is something that happened in your grandparents, great-grandparents' lifetime. Okay? They lived among a world religious system based on human merit. They were seeped in it. But if you go back 400 years, that's not the case. The same preachers who over and over and over again say you must be born again invariably put it in, in a context that it's up to you. You know, you, you ought to want to be born again. You can do it or you can refuse it. Now, if you just flip a few pages, you would read the same construction. You must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, I'm not going. I'm not going. You guys can go, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go to that. There's just no reason for me to go to that. If there's a a big reward for me there, well, I'm not. I'm not gonna claim it. You know, I've got so much humility. You know, I, I don't. I ain't going. I don't want to go.
I choose not to go. I'll, I'll, I'll leave my reward there for, for Jeff or, or Marilyn or Don or Deborah or David or, 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 you know, any one of you out there, somebody else. I'm not going. And, and the minister says, now, wait a minute, Steve, Steve, you don't have any choice. What do you mean I don't have any choice? Well, Steve, you've got to go to the judgment seat of Christ. You've got to be kidding. Just a few chapters before, you said I must be born again and that it was my choice. Now, 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 can you take my choice away from me in one place and insist? How can you take my choice away from me in one place and insist that I have a choice in another? The truth, folks, is that I can't anymore get out of being born again than I could get out of appearing before God at the judgment seat of Christ. Both express the must of necessity. You must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You must be born again. But Jesus was not telling Nicodemus he had to do anything. And Nicodemus, who understood the language, knew that. He knew that. He knew exactly what Jesus was saying. What Nicodemus heard was that it's born again just like you were the first time. And so, and so he says, how do I get back in my mother's womb? Because he knows he can't. He knows it's impossible. So Christ said to Nicodemus, he basically said, you're changing the subject to, to uh, obstetrics. We're talking about something else. We're talking about birth from above. How can you be a teacher in Israel and not know this? It is absolutely imperative that one be regenerated, and we see in our text how that occurs. We see how it occurs right here. God is showing you how it occurs by His mercy. By His mercy. Not by the flesh. Not by the will of man. Not by some act on your part. By His mercy. Based completely on regeneration. Cleansed entirely by that generation. But it, it's a regeneration. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Except a man be born of water and wind. He shall not see the kingdom of God. Well, we need to talk about that a little bit. Because, you know, the translators understood that I probably knew what water meant. But they recognized that anybody with my limited understanding would never know what wind meant. So they, so they put spirit in there. So now they, now they have Christ say, except a man be born of water and spirit, he shall not see the kingdom of God. One of the translators told me that Christ was using symbolic language when he said wind. And I say to the translator, well, that's very interesting. Was he using symbolic language when he said water in the same sentence? How can you say that it's symbolic language on wind, but it's literal language on water? And great numbers of Christians take that verse. That's the water of physical birth, you know, physical human birth. And the spirit is something spiritual. Now, wait a minute. If one is symbolic, the other is symbolic. I only have to turn a page or two in the Gospel of John, and I'm told that the water is the Word of God. In Ephesians 5, now are you cleansed, that is washed. Washed is the, is the Word. By the Word, which I've spoken unto you. Except a man be born by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what would keep him out of heaven? Adam's condemnation. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation, so it must have been removed. There must have been... Oh, listen, folks, listen. Listen carefully. There must have been an unlimited atonement aspect of the death of Christ to remove Adam's condemnation for all men Clearly declared in Romans chapter 5. Clearly inferred in, in Revelation chapter 20. They, they were judged out of the books according to their works. Well, they don't need to be judged according to their works. They sinned in Adam. They only need to be judged according to Adam's works unless, unless 
they were justified with respect to Adam's work. So you were alive, you died in Adam, you are made alive by the word of God because Jesus Christ removed Adam's condemnation. You died in your own sin. I was alive once apart from the law, Paul says. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And so you are regenerated the second time by the Spirit of God, not by anything you did. The text is clear. Not by anything you did. I'm kind of astounded at, at, at how any Christian could not adore that reality, could not love that truth. Oh, but Steve, it's got to be by something I did. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of the one shall many be made righteous. You're made righteous, therefore you can do righteousness. And the reason the article is there is to tell you that it's the same group who are made righteous, the same group that, died, that were made sinners in, through their disobedience, the same group that died in Adam are the same group that were made righteous. Folks, these are wonderful truths. A child, a small, a young, we call him an innocent child. Oh, that, he, oh, he's so innocent. Oh, that child is so innocent. Yeah, he can he can be, you know, go through his terrible twos. But the truth is, folks, he is innocent. He's he's precious. He, that child is is holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. He stands, that child stands before God, spotless and without blame, because Christ paid the price. He removed Adam's transgression in the life of that child. He was generated. The child was generated. And despite what you, you want to believe, that child is capable of doing righteousness. But there comes a time, and God doesn't give the age, that it's probably a good thing He didn't. I think there's a good reason. I think for obvious reasons, we, we know why He didn't. There comes a time, just as Paul said, when the commandment comes, sin revives, and I died. I died in my own sin. That's what the law does, folks. That's what the law does. We know from Scripture that where the power comes from, that the law is the strength of sin. If you put me under law, I'm going to break it. Okay? It's not that the law is not holy, righteous, and good. It's that I can't keep it. And that was proven with Israel. But sin shall not have dominion over us because we're not under law but under grace. And when you put a Christian under law, you are not helping him, folks. Let me tell you. You're not helping him. You're throwing gas on the fire. That's what you're doing. Because the law is the strength of sin. So the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And now I need born again. And Paul was. Paul was born again. As were you. And as, as was I. So now they can do righteousness. They couldn't do it before. Were they made righteous synergistically? No. They were made righteous by the obedience of Christ. Made known by the Spirit of God. And folks, that is a wonderful truth. No wonder that we have a certain hope that we rejoice in with joy unspeakable. Well, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. I'm just rambling now. I hope everyone is safe out there. Thank you so much for your continued prayers for this ministry, for your love, your messages of encouragement and support. 
Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.